So then it says Pentecost 2020, and it says fueled by the powers of the age to come. So those of you that are here, could you say that with me? Fueled by the powers of the age to come. So that gives you a lot in one little package there, because I'm quoting from Hebrews 6, 8, uh, 5, sorry, where it says that we've tasted of the powers of the age to come. That's the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's another way you can look at his role, is what we will have for eternity when Jesus returns and we rule and reign with him right here on the earth. The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven and the saints rule and reign with him forever. That's the age to come. And there are powers in that age that supersede the power that we have here. The interchange where those two things overlap and interlock is Holy Spirit. We have it in part now because of what happened on the day of Pentecost. When we see him, there's no more tears, right? There's no more pain. There's no more dying. There's no more death. In the middle, we live in this dying world, and our friend Daniel quoted it when we had him uh, on Tuesday night. Wasn't that great interview with Daniel Amstead? God, I love that guy. And so though the outward man is perishing, inwardly re we're being renewed day by day. That's the power of the age to come. And if you're saved a long time, you might have forgotten what the power that was fueling you before you got saved. And I don't want to give honor to the devil, but I can just tell you, I was not being fueled by the power of the age to come. I was being fueled by the pleasures of this world. And, and, and the Bible even says there's pleasure in the sin, but it's only for a season. Amen. About Moses, right? He ignored the pleasures. He turned away from the pleasures of sin for a season. But I only ever knew, I mean, even though I had been to church, it wasn't a real relationship with God. So I was trying to play the game by the sports and being the captain of the football team and, you know, the guy. When you walk in the room, you're the guy. And, you know, half the time you were more worried about the pretty girl on your arm if everybody else was going to be impressed with her or not. I mean, how shallow can you be? It had nothing to do with her. It was just whether there was going to be a wow effect. And that's, that's bankrupt. That's a bankrupt way of thinking. We use each other because, oh, well, if you, don't, if you gain 10 pounds, I'm not going to love you anymore. Well, you should run from anybody that says that yeah. as fast as you can. Yeah. It's the content of your character, okay? Now, it doesn't hurt that my wife is beautiful, okay? I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'm very happy about that, but... I love the fact that she loved Jesus more than me. <laughs> I knew that. She loved Jesus more than anything else. And that should be your number one priority, amen? Because the beauty comes on the inside. And that's what it says in Peter's epistle. It's just not, not just the outward ornaments that we wear. It's the beauty of the spirit that surrendered to Jesus and loves the Lord that we love. So we're fueled by this power of Holy Spirit. But if your tank is empty, it could be because you haven't been giving enough place to him. You have to surrender to him. You have to say, it's not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And yes, we need to read the word. But the Bible without the spirit oil to mix in there will kill people, right? Because it'll become legalistic. But just the spirit without the word will kill you. Because <laughs> you'll be floating off into the distance somewhere without the grounding of the word. And it's a shame, really, that the Pentecostal movement has been tagged sometimes as being excessive and, and abuses have happened. Well, abuses have always happened everywhere in every field, medical doctors, lawyers, right? So it's also true in the church. That's really unfortunate. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, whatever other analogy you want to use. The Holy Spirit is one of the Trinity and he lives inside of you. So you ask him, help me understand what I'm about to read in this book today. It's the bestseller of all time for a reason. Because it's the truth. But if you read it through the lens of legalism, you could kill people. But with the oil of the Holy Spirit lubricating your mind and, and your understanding, especially around this topic of treating other people the way you would want to be treated if you were them. It's very hard to do. Easter that prayed here earlier today, she grew up in Alabama, and her parents were sharecroppers in Alabama. She ended up graduating high in your class, I don't remember, was... Valedictorian of her class. And, uh, yeah, I mean, so you talk about somebody that might have been dealt a hand that, that wasn't ideal and overcoming, you know, the, the situation that she was in. And then, um, you know, get, getting a degree in college at a time when women, you know, weren't necessarily 
the, the most welcomed on the, on the university campuses and then become a research scientist for her career. So there are ways to overcome, but we don't want to oversimplify anything. I'm just saying that she understood what it was like to feel the brunt of that bias and prejudice and yet still overcame. The Lord is the difference maker, right? The way maker, right? He's the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. That's who he is, amen, right? Makes a way when there is no way. That's the God we serve. But we have to keep it within ourselves and be fueled by the right fuel of Holy Spirit, not the contention and the hatred, which really can remain in our flesh even after we're a Christian. There could be a little Archie Bunker living on the inside of us. He's got to be crucified, amen? Somebody better say amen. So this is a little bit of an expansion of what I already quoted about the powers of the age to come. And I, I put here just my own version of a partial definition of what it would mean to be a Christian. Hebrews 6, 4, and 5 says, Those who have once been enlightened. How many of you have been enlightened? That's the day you got saved, right? I mean, they sing about it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I saw the light. I saw the light, right? No more darkness. I saw the light. So that's the word that we're, we're told many times in, in the New Testament, that we became enlightened the day the light went on and we realized there really was a spiritual war going on. So that's true of Christians. And how about have tasted the heavenly gift? Have you done that? Yes. Have you tasted seeing that the Lord is good? Yes. yes, we've tasted of the heavenly gift of man, forgiveness alone. Yes. How many of us wept tears to say, how could you love me that much? That as many bad decisions as I made, I never could have earned the right to be in right standing with you, yet you love me so much. I've tasted of that heavenly gift. And then shared in the Holy Spirit, right? So again, whether you speak in tongues or not is, is not the issue. That became, a, in my mind, a, a, a distraction among the church about whether tongues was for today or not. Look, it's very convicting living under the submission to the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. It's very... Sub convicting reading the Bible and seeing that I'm supposed to love my enemies. It's like, no, nah, I think I'll read Sports Illustrated because they're not confronting me with the sin that could be in my heart still, even as a Christian, right? But the Word of God just keeps popping out. This is a different way to be a human being is to be molded into His image. But why not just start your day on your knees and say, Holy Spirit, I'm handing you the wheel right now. Jesus, I'm handing you the wheel. Father, I'm submitting, not my will, but your will be done. Because I know without that prayer, I could easily allow my flesh to be the one in charge and feel justified in my anger. Well, let me tell you something. Everybody feels justified in their anger. <laughs> That's why you're angry. You feel like you have a reason, but somebody already said it here today. Be angry and sin not. Who's that, Carolyn? Oh, Trisha. Yeah, so be angry and sin not. You get the star. Can you be angry and sin? I'll start with the easy question. Yeah, you can be angry and sin. But to be angry and sin not, you need Jesus. So like, we know he was angry because he flipped over the tables in the temple. But we also know he didn't sin. So I, I, I think that was really where you were going with your prayer. Be angry, but sin not. It's okay to hate injustice. God hates injustice. But... If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Amen. So violence ain't the answer. And then it says, those who have tasted of the goodness of the power, I'm sorry, the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. So that's us as Christians. We have tasted the goodness of the word and the powers of the age to come, where there's no death, there's no sickness. We have authority in this, in this world of death and sickness. God gave us authority over that thing. And I think it really does get back down to the motive of our heart again, whether we're using it to exploit the gift in us so that we can be famous or are we trying to make Jesus famous? Because the Bible says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Watch your motives. When you give a gift, don't do it where everybody can see you because the things you do in secret will be rewarded openly. That's part of the power of the age to come. Ego gets crucified. And one, one of the things we've learned through all the years of teaching the Elijah House classes and Possessing Your Vessel and so many other versions of that is that if 
Because God loves you, he doesn't want you walking around with hidden secrets in there. And he'll give you time to allow it to surface and deal with it. And if you don't, he'll, if you don't go to the mountain, the mountain will come to you, basically. Okay? So here I was telling somebody yesterday, Corey Ten Boom, she just got, got done giving a lecture on forgiveness. And then the prison guard walks up and asks to, if she could forgive him. And in her own natural strength, she said, I couldn't do it. But I asked the Lord, I can at least extend my hand and then you can fill me with your power to try to love this guy who basically killed her sister. Supernatural. But she was willing to try. She was willing to be obedient to say, yes, I will at least try. That's the power of the age to come happening in the present. Not without God. Not happening. You can take all the the courses on how to improve yourself. If If it's not driven by the Holy Spirit, you're going to build up self. And Jesus says, crucify self. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand do. And the things you do in secret, that's what gets rewarded openly. Your gift will open the door. The gift in you will make room for you without you having to self-promote. I'm starting to preach. Watch out. 